This is lecture 14, Infringement and the Doctrine of Equivalence, Part 1. The agenda for this lecture is to first cover the basics of infringement, just so that we're all on the same page as to what patent infringement means, how it operates, uh, and again, this is the relatively straightforward, traditional, literal infringement that we'll talk about. And then we'll move on to the doctrine of equivalence, which in some ways is the more important part uh, of understanding patent infringement, certainly the more complicated part and the one that we're going to spend most of our time over the next few lectures on. So let's start with the basics of infringement. Section 271 of Title 35 defines ba the basic patent right and therefore patent infringement. And what it is, it's a right to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering to sell, or importing subject matter that falls within the scope of the claims. That's patent infringement, right? What's the scope of the claims? Well, we learned that over the last few classes, what claim construction is. So whatever the claim is construed as, that subject matter that falls within that is uh, the right of the patent owner to exclude others from that scope. So there are two categories of infringement as well to understand. The first is direct infringement where uh, the party to um, the lawsuit is the one who's infringing. Uh, that means if I own a patent, I sue you, you are being accused of patent infringement. There's another form of infringement that we'll cover later in the course which is indirect infringement and that is the circumstance where I may be suing you, but you may in fact not be the one who has infringed the patent, but instead you may be enabling or in other or in, an, in another way assisting somebody else in infringing the patent. And, and under the patent law, that is also infringement. So indirect infringement uh, is also infringement. Uh, obviously, it adds another layer of complexity to the understanding of what we mean by infringement and, and whether somebody can be liable, but it still is infringement. Uh, and it's important to understand that, and we will discuss that later in the course. For now, we're going to focus on direct infringement. Right? We're going to focus on the classic case of patent infringement. I own a patent. I think you, uh, through the manufacture of your product or the provision of a particular service, have infringed my patent. So there are two forms of direct infringement. One is literal, literal infringement, uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And the second is infringement via the doctrine of equivalence, which we're going to spend most of the next few classes on. So what is literal infringement? Well, let's give an example here, right? Uh, we have uh, our, our claim, a writing implement comprising a wooden cylinder with a hollow core, a cylinder of graphite in said hollow core, a small cylinder of erasing material attached to one end. Which of the following infringes the claim? a wooden pencil with a small metal clip for shirt pocket storage. That would infringe. Again, we have a comprising transitional phrase. Right? So the addition of an additional piece, the, the metal clip, uh, would not prevent infringement. And so therefore that first item would infringe. A plastic pencil where the body is made of plastic. That would not necessarily infringe not literally anyway. Why? Well, because the wooden cylinder with a hollow core is a claim element. So there would be no infringement there. Now, as we're going to talk about over the next couple classes, there might well be doctrine of equivalence infringement if the plastic body was equivalent to the wooden body that was claimed. But for literal infringement purposes, that is not an infringing article. And then finally, a pencil without an eraser. Well, there's just an entirely missing element there, right? The claim element, the claim requires the element of an eraser attached to the end. And so a pencil without an eraser is simply missing an element and clearly does not infringe, uh, literally. Or frankly, as we'll find out, not going to be able to infringe under the doctrine of equivalence either. So the case that I had you look at with respect to literal infringement was Laramie versus Amron. Laramie's about super soaker um, uh, uh, devices, um, squirt guns, high powered squirt guns. Any of you who have kids know that uh, this is a very popular toy. Actually, it's popular with adults too. Uh, and, uh, and so the accused infringing device is actually pictured there. The key claim element 
uh, was uh, an elongated housing having a chamber therein for liquid. And the question is, does that picture, does the device pictured right there, include that claim element? Because again, for literal infringement to apply, each and every element has to be literally present in the accused device. And the argument is, well, the claim here says an elongated housing having a chamber therein for liquid, so basically a liquid holding uh, container was inside the housing, the housing meaning sort of the barrel of the gun. Uh, if you read the specification, looked at the images, that's what the patentee seemed to, to mean by the elongated housing. So the patentee claimed that there was a, uh, a liquid chamber inside uh, the element uh, inside the elongated housing. Super Soaker uh, has uh, a chamber for water, to be sure. These things don't work, obviously, without a chamber for water, but it's external. You can see it right there, the green. Right? It's an external tank. And so the question is, is that, uh, does that include, um, is that the same thing, is that literally the same as having an, a housing with a chamber therein? And the court decides no. Right, that is not the same. It does not literally infringe uh, the claim uh, because it's an external reservoir rather than an internal chamber. So this just gives you a sense of what literal infringement is. Literal infringement means you go element by element and you look for uh, the, the accused infringing, you look in the accused infringing product for each of the elements. And if one is missing or different, then there is no infringement uh, under literal infringement. Now that we've covered literal infringement, let's move on relatively quickly to the doctrine of equivalence. So if you don't find literal infringement, that does not end the question of whether or not there's infringement in the given case. Because you can still infringe under what's known as the doctrine of equivalence. Right? So you might ask yourself, how did this develop? Why have this kind of analysis. I mean, don't the claims mean what they mean? Haven't we said all along for the entire course up till this moment that the key to understanding the scope of a patent was to understand the scope of the claim? And now I'm telling you I lied to you that in fact it turns out the claim is really not the full measure of the scope. You get something else. You get equivalence. And indeed that is true. The doctrine of equivalence is a uniquely American innovation in patent law, and really you can trace it back to the case of Winans versus Denmead, which is mentioned a couple times in the book but not set out. But it's an interesting case, and I think it reveals the way the court uh, was thinking about this issue uh, when it developed it. The technology here is, is rail cars uh, that would hold sort of bulk material, gravel, dirt, um, corn, coal, those sorts of things. Um, and that's the basic technology. And, and pro the prior art, prior to Winans' invention, was that you would have a square cross-section. These are, if you sort of cut the car um, uh, horizontally or vertically, uh, you could look at the cross-section. The cross-sections of prior art cars were square. Um, that had a number of disadvantages, uh, the, primarily being that, that when you released from the bottom, the cone part at the bottom was, was typically a chute that would open that when you released from there, that would, um, you'd often have material that would, that would accumulate in the corners uh, and you would have to you know, send somebody in there with a broom or, or a shovel to, to move things out of the corner. Uh, and, so, and it would generally take longer to get the material out um, than otherwise. Winan's invention was to create a circular um, approach uh, to um, the cross-sectional uh, uh, dimension. Um, to avoid the problem that the prior art had and, and the chute would be at the bottom again and, and there was no uh, corners essentially for the bulk material to be lost in. Denmead, the accused defendant in the case, um, uh, had a basically a polygon, right? A many-sided, uh, um, not quite circle, but a many-sided uh, object that would uh, have many of the same features as Winan's invention. 
but but wasn't quite the same and indeed had some advantages and the primary advantages were that it was easier to manufacture than a circle um, at the time here uh, that we're talking about the mid 1850s uh, steel uh, in a circular pattern was difficult to manufacture much easier to weld um, straight plates together uh, and so the Denmead device actually had some advantages what the court said though is that what Denmead did was essentially steal the essence steal the essence of uh, Winan's invention and then indeed although Denmead's in some ways was actually affirmatively better than Winans invention that it would still because it used the basic idea that Winans had it was equivalent right the course said it was it was effectively equivalent to the Denmead uh, invention and therefore could be as culpable um, as, uh, as 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 if it literally infringed so this is the beginning of uh, the the doctrine of equivalence this idea that that even if you don't literally include the, um, uh, all of the elements of the invention literally, you can still infringe under the equivalence. And so this continues as a matter of sort of judicial present for, uh, precedent for many years. And then comes the, the Graver tank case in 1950. Right. The technology here is welding fluxes. The materials that you use, uh, you add uh, typically elect uh, high voltage electricity and heat um, to create a weld. The claim here was that the welding flux had an alkaline earth metal in it plus calcium fluoride. That was the innovation. The accused product had a non-alkaline earth metal, so a slightly different combination of, of um, components, also calcium fluoride. Right? So alkaline and non-alkaline metals perform similarly in this context. This was undisputed. The prior art suggested that alkaline and non-alkaline metals would work more or less the same. And Lynn didn't appear, the defendant here, didn't appear to have done any independent testing or research. What they seem to have done is merely recognized upon reading the Graver tank patent that they could substitute a non-alkaline metal, earth metal, for uh, the alkaline metal that was claimed and thereby avoid the patent. So the Graver tank case really establishes in a fundamental way the modern doctrine of equivalence. Most of what we think about in terms of the doctrine of equivalence today comes from Graver tank. And I say that both as a pro and a con. I actually regard the, the Graver tank case as, as you know, one of the worst cases uh, of patent law um, out there because of a variety of things that it says, and I think it's introduced a lot of confusion, but there's no doubt that it is fundamental to the way that we understand uh, the doctrine of equivalence today. So they established the key test in Graver tank. When the accused device performs substantially the same function in substantially the same way to achieve substantially the same result, that's equivalence, right? And this is what we call the function way result test. Substantially the same function, substantially the same way to achieve substantially the same result. That's the test for equivalence. That's the basic test for equivalence known as function, way, and result. But Graver Tank goes on to do more than merely establish the test. It says a number of things about the way that doctrine of equivalence should be analyzed. And what it says is, what, it deter what determines equivalency must be determined against the context of the patent, the prior art, and the particular circumstance of the case. Equivalence in the patent law is not the prisoner of a formula and not an absolute to be considered in a vacuum. Right? So the idea that Graver Tank has is that equivalence is almost a, is a true case-by-case -case analysis, something that you have to understand the full context of the invention uh, in the accused product to, un, to, to do. There's no formula for it. It's not an absolute. You can't consider it in a vacuum. You have to consider all of the circumstances. And then they go on. An important factor is whether persons reasonably skilled in the art would have known of the interchangeability of an ingredient not contained in the patent with one that was. So known interchangeability is an important factor because that reveals that the substitution, the court thinks, is not very difficult. Right? So it didn't take much innovation. Right? They go on to, to hold that the equivalence is a determination of fact. That's critically important because that means in a patent litigation context, equivalence decisions go to the jury, 
right? So you will send, just like you do typical infringement analysis, you would send the doctrine of equivalence question, is this equivalent uh, to the jury and let the jury decide, obviously with the help of testimony and, and things like that, but it is a factual question. Uh, it also means that on appeal, uh, decisions uh, of um, the doctrine of equivalence are reviewed de novo um, or for substantial evidence uh, uh, by the appellate court. The court in Graver Tank goes on to say that there's no evidence that the accused device was developed as the result of independent experiments. Right. So again, what it appeared that Lynn did was simply read the patent, understand that non-alkaline and alkaline earth metals behaved more or less the same in this context, and merely substitute one for another. And the question is, is should that be culpable infringement? And the court in Graver Tank clearly thought that it should. You know, this is a debate. I mean, the other side of this is that the Graver Tank um, patentee claimed alkaline earth metals, right? So we're not sure exactly why they claimed alkaline earth metals, but they did. But there's also a, a little known fact if you go back and you look at the, the history of the Graver Tank litigation. In fact, we know that the Graver Tank patentee actually did claim non-alkaline earth metals, but the claim was rejected by the patent office because of prior art, and they changed it to, to include only alkaline earth metals. So in a sense, the, one of the reasons I don't like the Graver Tank case is that the patentee very clearly here seemed to get something via the doctrine of equivalence that it could not have obtained uh, by patent prosecution itself, by directly claiming it. Right? It seemed to almost game the system by getting the Supreme Court to agree that the substitution of alkaline and non-alkaline uh, was an insignificant substitution. But in any event, Graver Tank is still good law. It still establishes the modern doctrine of equivalence. The function way result test that I noted earlier is the primary test by which uh, courts evaluate um, uh, whether equivalence is present or not. Uh, is there a uh, substantially, when something uh, performs substantially the same function, substantially the same way to achieve substantially the same result, then there's equivalence uh, and therefore infringement if all of the other elements, of course, are present. So the, the doctrine of equivalence was controversial but essentially goes unchallenged until 1997 when the Supreme Court takes up the case, the issue again in Warner Jenkinson versus Hilton Davis. So Warner Jenkinson is a, is a critically important case for our current understanding of the doctrine of equivalence. The key claim limitation here was a pH of approximately 6 to 9. That's what the claim said. And the accused process had a pH of 5. So one question you should ask yourself, which has always been puzzling to me, is how does this case get to the Supreme Court uh, at all? Because it says approximately 6 to 9. Could you not call 5 approximately 6? And if 5 is approximately 6, if it fits within the scope of approximately 6, then you have a literal infringement issue, not an equivalence issue. Now the likely answer to this is that because um, uh, pH is measured on an exponential scale, it's really not possible to say that 5 is approximately the same as a 6 in pH terms. Um, on the other hand, you could argue that this is a pretty broad range of 6 to 9 and therefore taking into consideration the range, um, maybe 5 should be considered to be approximately 6. But in any event, this case goes all the way to the Supreme Court and it's not an issue of literal infringement. So the question is not whether 5 is approximately 6. The question is whether 5 is equivalent to approximately 6. Right? The other thing I want to note at this point is that numbers are particularly troublesome. Numbers in a claim are particularly troublesome when it comes to considering the doctrine of equivalence. Because it is very difficult to wrap your mind around what is equivalent to 5 or 6 in this case. What do we mean by 5 being equivalent to 6? Right? It's almost impossible to keep a straight face and say that 5 is equivalent to 6 or that 6 is equivalent to 7 because they're not. By definition, numbers are distinct. That's the whole point of having numbers. 
And so I just want to flag this. We'll see this later on when we talked about, talk about equivalence. Um, but numbers are really difficult uh, when it comes to equivalence, really difficult for the, the analysis. Here, we have approximately six. So the court had a little bit of wiggle room here. So it didn't seem quite so difficult. But just I want to note to you that, that numbers are a particularly troublesome aspect of the doctrine of equivalence analysis. So question one that the court took up was, does the doctrine of equivalence survive the 1952 Patent Act, right? So you'll remember Graver Tank established the modern doctrine of equivalence, but that was in 1950. In 1952, the entire patent law was recodified. And in fact, the law that we're studying today is primarily the 1952 Patent Act. Nowhere in, in, the, in the 1952 Patent Act does it say you get infringement of equivalence, right? Actually, it does. Turn, as it turns out, there is one place, one solitary place in the 1952 Patent Act that describes equivalence, and that is in 112 paragraph 6. 112 paragraph 6, now known as 112 paragraph F, says that an element in a claim for a combination may be expressed as a means or a step for performing. This is means plus function, and it shall be construed to cover the corresponding structure material or acts described in the specification and equivalence thereof. So the argument that was made is that this that by recodifying the law of patents in 1952 and only placing the word equivalence in this one specific location, 112 paragraph 6, what Congress meant by this was that the if you wanted to get infringement under the doctrine of equivalence, you had to claim in a means plus function format. That's the argument, right? So the argument is that essentially Congress outlawed means plus function, or sorry, doctrine of equivalence, except in cases of means plus function claims. So that was how it was presented to the Supreme Court. And they look into that, and they analyze the legislative history uh, and and the, the commentary that went along with the 52 Act and so forth, and they ultimately decide that that's not true. That in fact, um, the general principle is that unless Congress is very clear about abrogating a particular doctrine, um, that then the court was very reluctant to do so. Um, the basic, uh, over and over, the legislative history of the 1952 Act says um, that the uh, that the purpose of the, the, the act was to codify the then existing state of the law and that it was supposed to basically freeze the law in place except for where it was uh, directly inconsistent, things like obviousness and, and indeed 112 paragraph 6. And so ultimately the Supreme Court decides that the 52 Act, even though it's somewhat ambiguous as to what Congress was thinking with respect to 112 paragraph 6, that it did not really eliminate the doctrine of equivalence entirely um, and that the inclusion of it here in 112 paragraph 6 didn't tell us very much about what uh, Congress intended with respect to the doctrine of equivalence, but and more importantly, it didn't clearly express an intent to overrule and get rid of that doctrine. So the doctrine of equivalence survives, right? But the court goes on to say, we understand that there's a lot of disputes about the doctrine of equivalence, right? The issue here, the major issue with the doctrine of equivalence from the court's perspective, and indeed the Federal Circuit have been dealing with this or, or complaining about this, is that it undermines what's known as the notice function of claims, right? The idea of claims is that by defining carefully what your, what your subject matter is that you are claiming, you are giving notice to all others, inventors, non-inventors, competitors, etc., about what it is you have invented and more importantly, what you have not invented. And therefore, claims provide this function of notice, telling you, almost like a fence around your property, telling you where the boundaries are. Stay off of my property, for example. Right? And that the doctrine of equivalence can deeply undermine that because until you go through a function way results analysis in front of a jury, you don't know where the boundaries are. You don't know what the full scope of your invention is. Uh, and more importantly, your competitors don't know. And so the concern that had been raised over and over is doesn't the doctrine of equivalence undermine and destroy this notice function of patent claims?
And the court takes this up and says, we agree that this is an important issue. Right? And what they do is, is the first thing the court does is it establishes what we're going to study uh, in the next class, which is known as the all elements rule. The court says it, it um, uh, is establishing this. Indeed, this, is really, this had really actually been the rule of federal circuit for several years before Warner Jenkinson. But in any event, the Supreme Court thought it was making uh, a new rule here when, in fact, it really wasn't changing anything. The all elements rule says the doctrine of equivalence, just like literal infringement, has to be applied on an element-by-element basis, right? So back to literal infringement. In order to find literal infringement, you have to go element-by-element element and point to each element in the claim that's also in the accused device. And what the court says is that's the same analysis. You do the same thing for equivalence. What you do is you take each element and you point to its equivalent in the accused infringing device, right? And so the idea here is that this cabins to some degree the scope of equivalence because you have to go element by element. The equivalence can't be equivalence of the invention generally. They have to be equivalence of the particular elements of the claimed invention. And that should narrow the scope of the doctrine of equivalence, right? And, and so the court describes this as helping reconcile this tension between the notice function and the doctrine of equivalence. And to some degree, it certainly helps, right? It certainly makes the doctrine of equivalence narrower. Uh, it makes it less open uh, to sort of general arguments about what's equivalent to the basic idea of an invention. Um, it, it means that, you know, cases such as Winans versus Denmead probably couldn't happen again um, uh, and so forth. On the other hand, it still leaves open a lot of uh, potential for uncertainty because you still don't know what we really mean by equivalence. Um, and uh, even going element by element, there's the potential for a lot uh, of scope to be added um, to the boundaries of the claim and therefore undermine the notice function. And so the court went on to say, with these limiting principles of, as a backdrop, we see no purpose in going further and micromanaging the Federal Circuit's particular word choice for analyzing equivalence. We expect that the Federal Circuit will refine the formulation of the test for equivalence in the orderly course of case-by-case -case determination, and we leave such refinement to that court's sound judgment in this area of its special expertise. So it declines to address in any detail the linguistic framework by which um, there was a lot of argument in the case about whether function way result was the right analysis or whether there was some other analysis, whether, and the court basically punts on that and just says we're not going to decide that. The Federal Circuit can decide how to analyze equivalence. Um, we are not going to micromanage, right? Um, and so uh, they... Uh, although Graver Tank, what they go on to say is it is not related, however, to intent. Graver Tank leaves room for the inclusion of intent-based elements. We do not read it as requiring them. The better view and the one consistent with Graver Tank's predecessors and the objective approach to infringement is that intent plays no role in the application of the doctrine of equivalence. Okay, so it's not an intent-based. So the fact that I tried to avoid your patent by swapping out a particular element, um, my intent has no relevance to that inquiry. Now, whether, I, whether what I did was equivalent to what your invention was or to what the element that I substituted was does have relevance, but it's, it's an objective analysis, not an intent-based analysis, right? So the court in Warner Jenkinson makes it clear that intent is not a component of patent infringement. And then they go on to say that prosecution history estoppel puts limits on the doctrine of equivalence and further insulates the doctrine from any feared conflict with the Patent Act, by which it means the notice function of claims, right? So the court specifically notes prosecution history as being critically important, right, to uh, the cabining the scope of the doctrine of equivalence. Uh, and so because of that, prosecution history takes on a new importance, and we're going to study that in the next class in some detail. Um, sort of generates an entire new round of litigation about the scope of the doctrine of equivalence uh, related to prosecution history estoppel. <clears throat> prosecution history estoppel uh, is the basic idea that if you give up uh, subject matter during the course of prosecution, you can't later reclaim it using the doctrine of equivalence. <clears throat>
Insofar as the question under the doctrine of equivalence is whether an accused element is equivalent to a claimed element, the proper time is at the time of infringement, not at the time that the patent was issued. Right? So there was an argument in the case about whether the doctrine of equivalence was limited to only those equivalents that existed at the time the patent was either issued or applied for. Right? The theory here is that maybe one way of cabining the doctrine of equivalence was to say that if a person of ordinary skill in the art would understand something to be equivalent at the time that the patent was applied for, those get included as equivalents, but that anything that came later, after arising technologies, for example, things that came up later, were not equivalent. So one example of this might be if I have a claim for fastening mechanism. Right? So I have a claim, part of my, one of my elements in my claim is fastening mechanism. And at the time I file my patent application, uh, the fastening mechanisms that people of skill in the art would understand were nails, screws, things like that. Now I get a patent and a couple years later somebody invents Velcro, right? A new fastening mechanism, an after arising technology, a new technology for fastening mechanism. The doctrine here, the argument would be that that is not equivalent because it arose after I filed. But that is not what the Supreme Court holds in Warner and Jenkinson. In fact, they appear to hold the opposite. They say that the time to analyze equivalency is at the time of infringement. So that means my Velcro, the Velcro could still be equivalent, right? It would still depend on the test, the function way result test, of course, and you'd have to argue it to a jury, but just the fact that it arose after my patent was applied for or granted is not enough to preclude the application of the doctrine of equivalence. All right, so that is what Warner Jenkinson is saying here. Finally, and perhaps one of the most important aspects of Warner Jenkinson, and, and one that was perhaps not fully realized by the court at the time, is footnote 8. Right? So they dropped this little footnote. And it's important to read it in its entirety. With regard to the concern over unreviewability due to black box jury verdicts, we offer only guidance, not a specific mandate. So the concern was that the doctrine of equivalence, as we noted earlier, is a question of fact. And if you send this to a jury, even if you tell them to go element by element, for example, you don't know that they're going to do that. Right? Jury verdicts are a black box. They either find it equivalent or they don't find it equivalent. You don't know whether you're using the correct test. You don't know whether they've considered all the correct evidence. And it's difficult to review. Right? And jury decisions obviously get substantial deference. So there is a lot of concern that the doctrine of equivalence was such an important doctrine for patent infringement that sending it to the jury was going to mean that most, jury, that most patent infringement trials were essentially unreviewable. And this is the response the Supreme Court gives. It's to say, we're going to offer some guidance here. Where the evidence, reading again from footnote 8, where the evidence is such that no reasonable jury could determine two elements to be equivalent, district courts are obliged to grant partial or complete summary judgment. If there's been a reluctance to do so by some courts due to unfamiliarity with the subject matter, we are confident the Federal Circuit can remedy the problem. All right, so point number one, issue more summary judgments, right? So they say pretty clearly here, we want, we feel like district courts should not hesitate to issue summary judgments. And indeed, they go on to say, if courts are reluctant to do so, the federal circuit can remedy the problem. What do they mean by that? They can reverse district courts that don't issue summary judgments. And then they go on. Of course, the various legal limitations on the application of the doctrine of equivalence are to be determined by the court, either on a pretrial motion for partial summary judgment or a motion for judgment as a matter of law at the close of the evidence and after the jury verdict. So they elevate what they call legal limitations on the application of the doctrine of equivalence. Right? They emphasize that these are available for courts to apply either before trial or at the close of a trial to determine the outcome. Thus, under the particular facts of a case, if a prosecution history estoppel would apply, so there's one limitation, or if a theory of equivalence would entirely vitiate a particular claim element, 
partial or complete judgment should be rendered by the court as there would be no further material issue for the jury to resolve. So this is an important passage, right? Because it says to the, to the courts out there, and in particular the Federal Circuit, that these, what it describes as legal limitations, and it particularly points out two of them, points out the prosecution history estoppel, and then this other thing that says if a theory would entirely vitiate a particular claim element, we're going to talk about both of those concepts in some detail uh, in the next class. If those apply, then it's summary judgment time. right? So, And then they say at the end, we leave it to the Federal Circuit how best to implement procedural improvements to promote certainty, consistency, and reviewability to this area of the law. right? So this is a green light to the Federal Circuit to figure out new ways of essentially deciding the doctrine of equivalence without juries. And the court specifically points out a couple of ways, right? Legal limitations, prosecution history estoppel, this theory of vitiation, right? Don't hesitate to issue summary judgment, they say, right? They are essentially telling the Federal Circuit in footnote 8, we understand that it's a problem to send the doctrine of equivalence to the jury, do something about it, fix it. Come up with procedural changes that are going to fix this problem. We support that. Okay? So let's note that what the court did in Warner Jenkinson, right? So it does decide that the doctrine of equivalence exists. It still survived uh, the, the 1952 changes to the patent law. It says, however, it's concerned about the scope of it, that it ta has taken on what it describes as a life of its own. And so it it determines that we're going to move, it, it affirms, which the Federal Circuit had already really decided, but it affirms that we're going to use a element-by-element element analysis, thereby tightening it. It also reaffirms prosecution history estoppel. It establishes that if you amend a claim uh, during prosecution, you are presumed to have uh, given up subject matter, and therefore estoppel will apply. So it makes that prosecution history stop and more powerful. And it includes this footnote 8, right? Which footnote 8 could be the most important holding of all, which is it essentially tells the Federal Circuit, if you're concerned about the juries and what they're doing with the doctrine of equivalence, then take it away from them. Take it away. Use summary judgment. Reverse district courts that don't grant summary judgment. Use the legal limitations, prosecution history estoppel, the theory of vitiation to take the issue away from juries and decide it with the judge because that would promote certainty, consistency, and reviewability. And indeed, as we're going to see as we go on further into uh, studying the doctrine of equivalence, the Federal Circuit took this to heart. And uh, the, the doctrine of equivalence today is a much reduced creature. There are uh, a variety of reasons for that, and we can talk about them, uh, and we will talk about them, but the, the, the doctrine of equivalence is much less powerful than it was prior to Warner Jenkinson, and a big part of that, perhaps the major part of that, is footnote 8. So let's talk for just a minute before we end about patent policy and how the doctrine of equivalence fits into it. Right? So why would you want to have the doctrine of equivalence? What are the arguments for it? Well, I think there are basically three arguments, and some of these you see in the cases, some of you don't. One is it's fair, right? just as a matter of basic equity. An inventor's rights would be valueless without the doctrine of equivalence. Right? Graver Tank in particular talks about this a lot, which is if you allowed um, pot your competitors to make minor changes, they could essentially render your patent to be valueless. And so the court, particularly in Graver Tank, says we want to prevent this. We want to provide a mechanism by which this can be stopped. Uh, and so that's the doctrine of equivalence. The second is that maybe the doctrine of equivalence furthers the basic purpose of the patent law, right? That we would undermine this careful balance between the inventor and society if we allowed society to make equivalent copies of the inventor's invention without being compensated. Right? So in order to keep the incentive structure intact, we need to not only give 
uh, infringement uh, power to literal infringement, but also to the doctrine uh, of equivalence infringement. And then, and then finally, one other way of thinking about the doctrine of equivalence is this is just a version of a broad construction of claims. By which, By which I mean, maybe what the doctrine of equivalence is really about, maybe the, maybe way, the way, way to justify it, is that we're, is trying, we're trying through the doctrine, the doctrine of equivalence to, to give the patent to everything, everything that she was actually entitled, entitled to. to. Right? And, and we presume, we presume that what teachers are trying, trying to do when they claim an invention is to get, to get as much as much as better coverage as they can, why they maximize their own value. Sometimes, Sometimes they can't do that because of a mistake, mistake, because they don't because realize, they realize that technology, technology changes are happening, happening uh, and, so and so forth, and, forth, and, that, and that, that we need to give them some help. Some help. Right? And because right. of that, we're going to construe their claims. We're going to use what we call this doctrine of equivalence to make them uh, get as much coverage as they are entitled to uh, at the time. So I think those are the three basic arguments for the doctrine of equivalence. And the question that I want to leave you with is whether these justify the costs, right? Because the doctrine of equivalence has very significant costs. It adds a lot of litigation. Obviously, it undermines, to some degree, the basic notice function of patent claims. You can now read a patent claim, and even if you can get over the problem that we discussed before in terms of not uh, being able to interpret the claim, even if you had a claim interpretation, you still don't know what the scope of equivalence is and therefore, uh, the fuzzy boundaries problem uh, becomes important, which is that you don't know where the, the invention begins and ends, and, and therefore, um, you can't make decisions, business decisions, based on that uh, without a lot of cost and, and effort. So there are real costs to the doctrine of equivalence, and the question is whether those costs um, are uh, are outweighed by the benefits that we get. And those benefits would be those the, the equity and fairness, the added incentives, uh, and perhaps um, you know this idea that what we're really doing is just trying to give the patentee the benefit of the doubt. Right? And so I want to leave you with that question, whether you think that the costs uh, um, are, are overcome by the benefits or not. And that's the end of Lecture 14, and I will see you next time.